Well, we're continuing in the book of Acts. And Acts is the Acts of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit in seeing the gospel go out everywhere. Acts chapter 8, uh, no, sorry, Acts chapter 10. Peter, uh, one of the original disciples, gets this, this vision and this understanding that the gospel is meant for everyone. God accepts everyone. And then, in, and we started here last week, Acts 13 and 14 is Paul's first missionary journey and we see the gospel going for the first time to Gentile territory, to people who weren't Jews. So the gospel is going everywhere. That's the mission of the church. The church is to be spirit-empowered people uh, going and uh, witnessing everywhere. Well, when people from Gentile nations begin to hear about Jesus, things start changing, but it shouldn't be a shock to us. I'm going to take you through a verse at the beginning of Mark, the beginning of Luke, and the beginning of John, and then tell you why we shouldn't be shocked by this. So Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. After John had been taken into custody, that's John the Baptist, he's in custody, uh, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. What's Jesus saying here? The kingdom of God is at hand. Now let's go to the gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 4 and verse 43, uh, Jesus said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. What did Jesus come to do? To preach the kingdom of God. Now let's go to the Gospel of John. Jesus answered Nicodemus here and says to him, Truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now most of you say, Pastor, I'm already bored. I know all about that stuff. We talk about the kingdom of God all the time. And we should. What you need to understand, though, is there are 39 books in the Old Testament where the phrase kingdom of God is almost non-existent. What you're reading about in the Old Testament is the kingdom of Israel. David's kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. Now Jesus comes and he's not talking about the kingdom of Israel. He's talking about the kingdom of God, what, what's, what's going on here? The ground is shifting. God's not coming to just some ethnic group on the, on the Mediterranean Sea. God's not just coming to reach Jews now. God is establishing a kingdom everywhere. Jesus is coming not to preach about the kingdom of Israel, but the kingdom of God. This is a huge change, friends. This is huge. But we've been so used to this kingdom of God stuff because we've been living in it. We don't recognize how significant it is here. And Acts chapter 15 is where the crisis comes kind of to a, a climax. And there's some Jewish people who are getting a little bit upset because they liked it when it was an ethnic religion. And now we've got 
uh, Jewish people coming, or people who aren't Jews coming into a relationship with God. And they've got a suggestion for everybody. And here it is, Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Some man came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Coming down means going up on the map to Antioch. And all these people who are Gentiles, all these people who aren't Jews, are getting saved. They're becoming Christians. And they say, well, slow down here, everybody. This isn't right. They can't be Christians unless you get circumcised first. Can't be Christians unless you get circumcised first. See, in the kingdom of God, you've got to be saved. You've got to be born again. John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus in talking to Nicodemus made that clear. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So there has to be this salvation experience, this, this born again experience. So the question is then, how does that happen? What's it mean to be saved? We talked about this last week. And the Jewish brethren are saying, we're not letting anybody into the club. Nobody gets into the club unless they get circumcised. And that's pretty hard to compromise on. I mean, <laughs> you either get the knife or you don't get the knife. There's, there's no compromise there. It's either got to be something you do or something you, you don't do. They say you've got to have the knife. You've got to be circumcised if you're going to be a Christian. So in Acts chapter 15, we hear a series of speakers. The Pharisees get up and explain their position. And then Peter talks. And then Paul and Barnabas get up and they defend their flock in Antioch, the church that they had seen created by preaching and teaching the gospel. And then James, who's in charge of the church of Jerusalem, wraps it all up. And when he wraps it up, and this is what we talked about last week, he says, guys, we've got to make sure we're not making it hard to become a Christian. Guys, we've got to make sure there are easy paths into the church. Let's not make it hard on everybody here. Easy paths, everybody. Easy paths, easy paths. So last week was a nice, simple sermon, really. This week, uh, not so much. So let's pray. Father, I, uh, well, you know where I'm at on this, Lord. I, uh, I recognize how much we need the Holy Spirit to just come and and speak to our hearts and give us clarity and real understanding of how we're supposed to live out our faith. So come, 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 please, and help us in Jesus' name, amen. So I'm gonna take Acts chapter 15 here, uh, and I'm going to kind of pick out three phrases in Acts chapter 15, which I hope will give us a big picture look at what's happening in this chapter. So three phrases from a really long chapter. We're going to look at them. And the first phrase I want to draw your attention to is from verse number nine. God made no distinction between us and them. Peter's saying here, God made no distinction between us, he's a Jew, us and them, the Gentiles. No distinction between the two. That's in reference to the two visions that we studied in Acts chapter 10. Do you remember the story? Peter's just kind of resting and praying a little bit and he gets a vision, and a vision of 
a sheet coming down from heaven and the sheet is full of all kinds of animals. And there's animals on there that the Old Testament calls unclean. Not supposed to eat those kind of animals. And Peter shakes his head and says, I wonder what that's about. Peter seems to have to have a lot of things happen three times to get it. So God sends the sheet again and it's got all these animals on it. Some of which are unclean and you're supposed to not eat them. Not supposed to have anything to do with them. The sheet comes three times in the vision, and then God says to him, uh, don't call unclean what I've called clean. Don't call unclean what I've called clean. Acts chapter 10, 34, verse, uh, verse 35, he says, I most certainly now understand that God is not one to show partiality. But in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Let me be crystal clear as one with some pastoral responsibility and authority in this house. That there is no room for us and them in the church. Period. There is no room for us and them in the church, period. God makes no distinction. God receives everyone from any nation who fears him and does what is right. <laughs> They're welcome to him. There is no Jew and Gentile in the church. There's no Jew and Gentile. <laughs> There's no male or female. Oh, they can't do that. They're women. This is run by men around here. There's none of that nonsense in the kingdom. None. There's no us and them. Well, I've been around here for 23 years now, so I expect people to listen to me. What do those people who've only been coming for eight months, why do we have to listen to them? Who are they? There's no us and them. There's no us and them in the kingdom of God. God makes no such distinct distinction. And this is a huge challenge uh, for the Jewish, devout Jewish people who've been <laughs> their whole life serving God and memorizing the scriptures and, and they're going to uh, the temple every weekend and every day to pray and seek God's face and, and they've been circumcised and they don't eat all the yucky food that Gentiles eat. They're holy. And now these newcomers are coming in and they're not circumcised and they eat any meat they want to and they're coming in and Paul and Peter and Barnabas are saying, welcome them, welcome them. And they says, you can't welcome them. They're not holy like us. And God says, and God says, there's no distinction between us and them. And it seems unfair that these pagan Christians can simply say, I believe in Jesus Christ now, and they get to usher. Can you imagine ushering? And they eat pork. Whew. What's the church coming to? They're upset. But Peter says it clearly here. There's no distinction. God has made it clear. There's no distinction between us and them. You see, the Jewish people would say, yeah, but that can't be right because we've worked hard to get our status. We've worked hard to get our status. But what does chapter 15, verse 9 says? He made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. It's not about works. It's a decision of 
Faith, verse number, I think it's 11. Let's see what comes up and then we'll know for sure. Verse 11. But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. How are we saved? It's not by works. It's not by taking out membership. It's not by being a member longer than someone else. We are saved by grace. Saved by grace. There's no distinction for any of us. That's how you get into the kingdom. That's how you get into the kingdom of God. God's establishing a new kingdom. He's no longer investing in the kingdom of Israel. He still loves the Jews, but his heart, his vision is bigger. It's for the kingdom of God, where the gospel goes everywhere. The gospel goes everywhere. So John chapter 3 is a great chapter. Story of Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a Pharisee, verse number one, John chapter three, but not only is he a Pharisee, he's a ruler of the Pharisees, so he's a bigwig among the Pharisees. He's one of the, the top dogs. And Jesus has begun his ministry, and Nicodemus has kind of noticed he's saying some pretty special stuff, but he doesn't want to get caught having a conversation with Jesus, so he sneaks in the nighttime, in the dark, goes and finds Jesus. And he wants to know how you become a Christian. And Jesus says to him, verse number three, you've got to be born again to enter the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus, well, yeah, but what about the 600 and some laws that I've been trying to keep all my life? Jesus is saying, no, you have to be born again. It's not about works. It's about what Jesus has done. It's the grace of God. It's really a love message. So this, many years ago, was the most famous verse in Scripture. Now the most famous verse in Scripture is, Judge not that you be not judged. I don't know what that says about us. But there was a time when this was the most famous verse in Scripture, and it's taken out of Nicodemus' story. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life friends this message this gospel this kingdom of god that you're a part of i'm a part of is rooted in love it's rooted in grace it is not of works and because it's not of works it's not of works there's no distinction between any of us there's no distinction between any of us you cannot pull, when you get to heaven's front gate, some nationality card and say, let me in because I'm a... My grandfather's Germanness is not going to get me into the kingdom of heaven. There's no distinction. It's by God's love and by God's grace. Second thing in this... Uh, chapter that stuck out to me in terms of phrases. Well, there were lots of them, but I'm trying to talk fast tonight um, so I can get most, of, most in what I want to get in, but, so I can't talk about every phrase. But here's the second phrase. Uh, God testified to them, giving the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. What's that talking about? God testified to the Gentile people that they were really in. They were really in Christ by giving them the Holy Spirit just like he gave the Holy Spirit to the nation of Israel, to the people of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. This is a Protestant church. Uh, if you didn't know that, it probably doesn't matter. But this is a Protestant church. And Protestants tend to put a great deal of weight on Scripture. And we say that we know what we believe because the Bible says so. We know what we believe because of what the Bible says. 
I want to suggest to you today that maybe that's not completely right. And this is being broadcast, so I am really on shaky ground here. Maybe this isn't completely right. The apostles here are making a decision about what they need to do. What must a man do to be saved? The apostles are making a decision here. And they don't have the New Testament. They don't have any of these 26 books that we value so highly. They're not written yet. And yet they're making a decision, and they're making a decision for the nations with only access to a constitution that was written for the nation of Israel, which is really what the Old Testament is. It's their, their laws. So let me stretch you tonight. Are you ready to be stretched? Everybody go like this. Hit somebody real hard in the face. Good. Let, let me stretch you a little bit here. I want to talk about mature theological formation. Mature theological formation. Scripture is foundational and scripture really, really matters. But when you're opening scripture, when you're opening God's word, you need to give some weight to tradition. You need to give some weight to the 2,000 years of Christians who've gone before you and written before you. Generational arrogance, any kind of arrogance, never serves anyone well. And if you think, well, I, I, I just figured out all by myself, I'm not going to listen to those old fogies from the 400s. You're not serving yourself well. Understand what God has been saying to the church for 2,000 years now. And don't think that the people who are living in 2021 have some market on truth and everybody else didn't figure anything out. Listen to scripture, but listen to scripture and what spiritual leaders have said down through the centuries. Tradition is not something you throw out the window. And listen to reason. We love God with our mind. Really get in there, study the word, think it through. But here, and I think this is a bit of a distinctive of spirit-filled Christians, you read scripture in light of experience. So what is Peter saying here as they figure out uh, what God is doing? What is the argument Peter is making here uh, when he says God showed them, God showed the Gentiles that they uh, were just as real as the Jews because he gave them the Holy Spirit. What is, Paul, uh, what is Peter talking about here? He's talking about what he saw God doing. Acts chapter 10, uh, verses 44 to 48. Peter's speaking, and the Holy Spirit falls on all of them who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the Gentiles. This is, what, this is weird. Gentiles getting the Holy Spirit? Everybody's amazed. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Peter said, hmm, if God is giving the Holy Spirit God is giving the Holy Spirit to Gentiles, then we better get these guys baptized in water really quickly. If God's been already given them the Holy Spirit, we gotta get them baptized in water. 
And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. How did Peter decide what to do here? Peter saw what God was doing. Peter saw what God was doing. So you, you factor in experience here. So all of this is the basis of mature theological formation. So a part of good theology, friends, is looking at what God is doing. What is God up to? We don't talk around here a lot about uh, being Pentecostal. I think it's more important to be Pentecostal than to wear a tag. But one of the, one of the distinctives of Pentecostalism is we haven't struggled with one of the things a lot of Protestant churches do, and that's whether women can be allowed to get involved in ministry or not. We don't struggle with that. Why don't we struggle with that? Because when God poured out his Holy Spirit the beginning of the 20th century, You know who he was leading almost more than, using more than man to start churches and to lead people into the fullness of the Spirit, to go out to places where nobody else would go to see the kingdom of God go forward? God was putting his hand on women. And I've spent a lot of time studying the history of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada in Saskatchewan. And it's the story of brave women over and over and over again who went to places where nobody wanted to go and they found a way to make some money and they started preaching the gospel and God established churches. And so what's the position we take? Hmm. God makes no distinction between man and woman. In Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek nor male nor female. Scripture says a big yes to that, but our experience helps us understand it. So mature theological development requires us to look at what God is doing. Oh, and now the tough stuff comes. Point number three. It seems good to the Holy Spirit, to God, and to us to lay no greater, to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials. So this is James talking to the Gentiles. Seems good to the Holy Spirit, God, and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials. And uh, I want to unwrap that. But before I unwrap that, I want to point something out here. How are they figuring out what's happening? How are they figuring out their convictions? Next slide. God is doing something. Next slide. God. Oh, no, sorry, not the next slide. Sorry, next point. Go back one. God testified to them, giving the Holy Spirit seems good to God. How did they decide? This is Acts chapter 15. This is a hinge on which all of Christianity stands. And how did they say, we've got to make easy paths for Gentiles to get in here? How did they come to that conviction? There was no New Testament scriptures to build it on. They looked at what God was doing. So, Here's the third phrase and my last phrase for tonight. It seems good to the Holy Spirit, God, and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials. No greater burden than these essentials. Now, there seems to be some tension here. Acts chapter 15, verse 10. There's that uh, 
Is that coming? Maybe, give me the next slide. I'll follow the slides. I'll probably get to this. Oh, no. Ethics of the kingdom. I need to read Acts 15.10. I'm speaking off the top of my head here, and it's not on the slide. So Acts chapter 15 and verse number 10. Let me, let me read this to you. Uh, Peter's talking. He says to uh, the Pharisees who wanted everybody to get circumcised to be Christians. He says, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? He says, why are you trying to make them like us? We can't even handle all the rules. So last week we left saying, praise God, I'm free in Christ Jesus. I'm not under the law of Moses. And friends, I want you to understand crystal clear, you are not under the law of Moses. But there's a tension here. We're not under the law of Moses. But father still has some family rules. Mature Christians are always grappling with tension. <laughs> we are not under, we're not under the law of Moses. But Father still has some family rules. And we can't all just run around and do whatever we feel like doing. We've got to know what the family rules are. So what are the essentials? What are the essentials? I'm going to deal with that under the wording ethics of the kingdom of God. Ethics of the kingdom of God. So ethics, what's ethics? I think we understand ethics if we understand the antonyms of ethics. And the antonyms of ethics from thesaurus.com are corruption, dishonesty, dishonor, evil, immorality. Ethics is the opposite of all of those things. It's morality, it's, it's right, it's honor, it's honesty, it's, it's uh, the absence of corruption. So what are the ethics of the kingdom of God? What are the ethics of the kingdom of God? Ethic number one. Ethic number one is the ethic of love. The ethic of love. Acts chapter 2, verse 46. All these people are becoming Christians. And what do they start to do? Acts chapter 2, verse 46. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, eating meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. What were these people doing? They were hanging out. They were hanging out together. They were going into each other's houses. And what were they doing in those houses? They're breaking bread and they're eating meals together. Now we've got a problem. Now we've got a problem. Gentiles are becoming Christians. And they eat in the minds of the Jews repulsive, dirty, yucky food. They're not keeping all the laws of Moses. So what, does the, what do the spiritual leaders say here? Hmm, this isn't going to work. If the Gentiles keep bringing all their dirty, corrupt, terrible, yucky food to the church meetings, every potluck's going to turn into a fight. So they say this. Uh, Acts chapter uh, 15 and verse 29a. You need to abstain from things sacrificed to idols and from blood and things strangled. This is all about the food they eat. It's all about the food they eat. What they're establishing here is uh, Gentiles you've got to practice the Christian ethic of love. Romans chapter 14, verse 17 is clear. Uh, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. <laughs> the kingdom of God is not about a bunch of rules about what you can eat and what you can't eat. That's not what the kingdom of God is about. Kingdom of Israel had lots of those rules. Kingdom of God is not about all those kind of rules. 
But here's the problem. There's lots of people from Israel who are now part of the kingdom of God. And how are we all going to get along at the potluck? If you Gentiles keep bringing your yucky food. So Gentiles, we're just asking you a favor here. Will you show a little bit of love to these Jews who are stuck in the mud? It's the ethic of love. It's what makes the kingdom of God work. It's uh, not about rules. It's just making sure we don't get antagonistic towards one another. Uh, because of the excessive use of our liberty. Galatians 5, verse 13. Stand fast, therefore, in your liberty. Uh, I better read it out of New American Standard Version. I'm quoting out of King James, which will only confuse you. You are called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. That's what the apostles are saying to the Gentiles here. There's all kinds of freedom here, friends. But here's what we need right now for the kingdom to work. Don't eat stuff that was killed by strangulation. Drives the Jewish folks crazy. And don't go buy that cheap meat that was offered to idols in worship. Bring good meat when you bring meat. They'll get upset that you're bringing unholy meat to the potluck. It's an ethic of love. And that's how the Christian community works. Secondly, there's the ethic of purity. The ethic of purity. Uh, Acts chapter 15, verse 29 uh, he said, Men, you've got to be careful what you eat, and then you abstain from fornication, from sexual immorality. Let me say this. We have all sinned. Every one of us has sinned. Many of us here, maybe most of us, have a day or a week or a month or a season where we weren't as wise as we should have been in our sexual activity and behavior. We're not here to present any condemnation. Certainly not going to come from me. But friends, but friends, it's one thing to acknowledge our sinfulness, it's another thing to say, and I don't care. The kingdom of God is supposed to have an ethic of sexual purity. I like what Randy Alcorn says on this subject in his uh, book, Sexual Purity. First thing he says is sex is good. And let us hear that loud and clear online tonight and in this sanctuary. Sex is good. God created it. And God called it good. And sex existed before there was any sin in the world. Sex is not sinful. Sex is not dirty. Sex is good. Has to be good because God made it. So that's the first thing we need to understand. Uh, sex was not created by Satan. Sex was not created by Playboy. Sex uh, was not created by the internet. Uh, it was not created by some pervert who runs a porn shop. Sex is good and sex was created by God. Second thing. Like all good gifts from God, sex can be misused and perverted. 
Water's a gift from God. If you don't have water, it's gonna, you're going you're gonna to die pretty quick. Water's a gift from God. But water out of control uh, turns into tidal waves, and it's absolutely destructive. So something good can be misused and perverted. Third thing that Randy Alcorn says, the boundaries of sex are the boundaries of marriage. The boundaries of sex are the bond boundaries of marriage. Let me read three portions of scripture to all of us now, and may the Holy Spirit speak to us. First Thessalonians chapter 4. This is the will of God, your sanctification. This, we live ethically. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion, like the Gentiles who do not know God. The church should be a safe place. The church should be a safe place for teenage gals and single young ladies to come without feeling like they're going to be uh, chased down and manipulated into something they don't want to do. Church should be a safe place. Next verse, Hebrews chapter 13. Let marriage be held in honor among all of us. Let the marriage bed be undefiled. That's where sex belongs. Fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 2. Uh, so what's the solution here? Because of immoralities, let each man have his own wife and each woman have her own husband. Oh, are we getting too PG here? How do you handle your sexual drive? You get married. You get married. Each one of you have your own husband. Each one of you have your own wife. It's the ethic of purity that should mark the Christian community. We failed. Most of us have failed. We failed. But our failure doesn't determine our conviction. The traditions and teachings which are consistent in Scripture and have been consistent in the Christian community for two millenniums is a tradition of sexual purity. And in a land and a nation and a world that's gone sex wild, we need to ask God to help us. At least I know I do. So I'm going to pause for a moment of reflection here. You don't need me to talk to you about this. And I just want us to bow our heads in a moment, but bring up the next slide and uh, let's just think here for a minute. The Council of Jerusalem clearly establishes the ethics of the kingdom of God. One of the expectations is established is that followers of Christ will abstain from sexual immorality. In simplest terms, abstaining from sexual immorality requires sexual relations to be limited to the marriage bed, the sacred relationship of husband and wife. Here's what I want us to stop and just pause in God's presence and think about. Do you need to make some changes in your life to come in line with this expectation? Are you in a sexual relationship outside of marriage? What is God calling you to do? Are you teaching your children the biblical standards of sexual behavior. 
This is an ethic. This is an ethic of Christian life. It's an ethic of the kingdom of God. Let's just allow the spirit a minute and a half or so to speak to us with you. Just look at those questions and maybe there's some things the Lord's asking you to do. Father, we live under your grace. We thank you for your grace, which covers all my sin, covers all of our sins. We recognize, O oh God, that none of us can unscramble eggs and are some things in all of our lives we wish were probably a little different. But I pray, O oh Lord, that by your Spirit you would help us to have a real strong and fresh understanding, O oh Lord, of your call upon our lives to live in sexual purity. Help us Help us, help us, help us, help us, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. What would God have you to do? What would God have you to do? Maybe God is speaking to someone even right now and saying, uh, it's time to make it right. It's time to get to the altar and time to commit your relationship to the Lord. It's time to get married. <laughs> Say yes to him. Say, Say yes to him. And the final ethic, and I won't talk about it long. Jenna, just keep playing. The rest of the worship band come. Is the ethic of unity. The ethic of unity. I like Acts chapter 15 and, and verse number 25 here. They work through all of this. And, and here's the conclusion. It seemed good to us having become of one mind. They became of one mind. The church, my friends, is most precious. The church, my friends, is most precious when we're not a bunch of squabbling, bickering people who get offended because somebody, somebody said this, somebody didn't let us do that. We ought to be marked by this unity that just finds it really easy to give in to others. We ought to be marked by this unity that finds it really easy to give in to others. I gotta quit, I gotta quit. Because I want us to have time for the Holy Spirit to speak to us tonight. But I think if you go right to the last uh, slide here, Trinity, thanks for your help tonight. There's a big shift in understanding taking place in Acts 15. 
You see, these Pharisees who'd become Christians from the kingdom of Israel thought this is how it worked. You believed in Jehovah God, you keep the laws, and then you're justified. That's not how it works. In the kingdom of God, and we're part of the kingdom of God, thank God. In the kingdom of God, you believe in Jehovah God is revealed in Jesus Christ, and then you're justified. Then you're justified. You're made as if you'd never sinned. That's what God does. Even before you're keeping the laws. And then you spend the rest of your life being made more and more into the image of God. At home, thank you for listening in. Here in the sanctuary, we're just going to take time to respond to the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. I'd encourage you, if you're listening online, the stats show that we lose about 40%, sometimes 60% of our audience as soon as the sermon is over. Can you stick around? Can you stick around in the presence of the Holy Spirit and just let him do a deep, ethical cleansing in our hearts tonight. God bless you. Love you. We all live and move and walk in his grace. Chelsea, lead us, please.